Hi, my name is Andy, and this is a video about React, which is a framework for writing web UIs. Um, the idea of this video is to give you the best possible uh, grasp of the fundamental ideas, so that when you read the React documentation or try and understand it, it'll make sense. And when you write the code, hopefully the code you write will be decent. You won't fall into the uh, traps that people often fall into the first time they write React code. So what we're going to look at, we're going to just talk about what React is. Um, and I'm going to say that what it's really for is just for describing the HTML or the, the browser state. We're going to talk about how to hold on to state and, and what we mean by that. Uh, we're going to talk about events and uh, needing to lift state up. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's going on underneath, which I think helps you understand why some of the rules that there are about writing React code are in place. Uh, and that's about it. So first of all, what is React? Well, React is a UI framework for making web applications, and basically it's really just for making single-page web applications. And I guess you could use it for just putting widgets on some other type of website, but um, where it's really strong is in uh, is having a decent conceptual model for single-page web apps. Um, what it's particularly focused on is making reusable UI components. So um, it's the first time I've seen a web um, widget framework where you could actually genuinely make um, a little bit of UI, like a search box with a, I don't know, a spinny thing in the corner or something, uh, and it would be genuinely usable in some other project. Uh, people, other people have tried to do that. Uh, I haven't been convinced, but this uh, React, I think it, it works. Um, and it's also pretty sane um, as a way of writing UIs that doesn't end you up with the awful event spaghetti uh, that I normally end up with when I try and write um, JavaScript UIs. Um, and the, the reason for that is because it's opinionated about the way your data should flow. And we'll get into uh, what its opinions are. I think they're good opinions. Okay, so first of all, the briefest of brief introductions to how to actually run it. Um, so first you should install Node.js, and there's about 10 million ways of doing that, so I won't tell you how. Um, and then you should run this uh, command, at least for your first React apps until you get the hang of it. Uh, you should use npx to launch the create React app command. Um, npx get, comes with your node install, so you should have that once you've installed node. Create React app is an, a thing, a little script that it will download that basically makes a framework for your application. And then when you cd into its directory, you can do npm start, and it not only starts a little web server with your application running it, it also launches your web browser to the right place to look at it. So it's very convenient. Um, so once you've typed that stuff, you've got a React app. Uh, running and we'll talk about what's in there um, and how it works. So here's a little app that I'm using as an example. Um, uh, it's a little, it's barely just a kind of a, a fairly fat widget for um, some kind of films website. So let me show you the real thing. So here's the thing really running um, and it has uh, a couple of features. So it kind of pretends that when you type in a search it will go off to the server and um, do a search, but it doesn't actually do that. Um, so instead it just logs the console saying, I would have done that. Um, so it's got a couple of just basically UI features uh, to demonstrate some of the ideas I'm talking about. So first feature is when I type in some letters, um, you can see it highlights um, those letters that are being searched for um, in the box below. And the other feature I've got, which is quite silly, is that if you type too many characters into the search box, it goes red because uh, you should only search for short strings. So that's a silly feature you wouldn't really have, but it demonstrates the idea of um, um, writing UI widgets. They've got a little bit more functionality than just what you get with the browser. So we've written, we've written a little component there where the text goes red um, if you type too much. So that's the example app we're gonna be going through and I'll show you um, some of the ideas that you need to get your head around to write decent React code um, in that context. So um, the first thing you're gonna, um, or the, the first, the place where your program starts, when you've done that create React app script, um, you'll get a file called index.js and it's gonna look something like this. And this is like the starting point um, in your head of your React app. So it does a few imports at the top, um, but the main thing that it does is it calls this react dom dot render function, um, and it, it you're saying you're basically saying to it render my thing, which is called films, into uh, a div, uh, which is in my HTML. So there's actually an index.html, which is very, very simple. 
but it does contain a div with an ID of root. So it does document.get element by ID root to get hold of that div. And it says to React, uh, please render this thing called films into that element. Um, so you'll notice that this doesn't look like JavaScript. This is like uh, JavaScript with a bit of superpowers added in, which I'll explain what that is in a second. The important thing for now is that this you can think of this as where your React app starts, and all it does is um, import a file, import a something from the file called films, something called films from a file called films, um, and films is um, a file that I created, which I'll show you in a second. When you first do create React app, then it will do this, except it won't be called films, it'll be called app.js. And I renamed it to films.js. I don't know whether that was a good idea or whether you should always have one called app.js, but it seems to work. Um, so here's some of films.js. So it imports some stuff. Again, these are things that I wrote, title, search, and list. Um, and then the main part of the file, this is the structure of um, a React component. So basically, it's a function uh, called films. Uh, it's being exported from this module. That's just the way that you um, make your code available to other code in a JavaScript module. Um, so that it's basically a function called Films um, with a capital F, which is important. It has to have a capital F. Um, and it returns uh, some more stuff that looks a bit like HTML, but this is still in the JavaScript file. So again, more of that magic is being done. So essentially, the Films um, component is itself made out of three components, title, search, and list. And as we've written it so far, all it does is just say, I want a title, a search, and a list. Um, so here is a visual representation of what those things mean. So that bit at the top there is what you get when you ask for a title. Title is some code that I wrote, and so is search, and so is list. So then the, the bit called search is that bit with a label and an input box. Uh, and the bit called list is that list down the bottom. So you can see that one component, which is called Film, is built up out of um, three smaller components called Title, Search, and List. And we've got this kind of weird magic HTML-like stuff happening inside our JavaScript. Um, so let's dig down a little bit. So um, uh, Search was one of those three things that we included in Films. Uh, so here is what Search looks like, search.js. So again, we have to import uh, React, even though, by the way, React doesn't get mentioned here, but actually React is needed for that magic HTML-like stuff. Uh, so you have to import that. And then we're importing some CSS. So the, each component has its own little CSS file that goes with it, and the way that works is that we import it here. So actually, um, these components that you write are quite self-contained little bits. They're a little bit of code like this. Well, it could be a lot of code, but... Um, they're like a self-contained file, search.js, with some code in it. Um, and also, often, they'll have a, a .css file that goes along. Um, so there's a little packet of JavaScript and CSS packaged together. Um, and actually, the build process means that that CSS won't pollute your other components. So uh, it really is kind of a, quite, quite a neatly little packaged component. So again, this is another React component. And again, it's a function. Uh, it's a function called search. Uh, and that's why we were allowed to include it by saying diagonal bracket search slash diagonal bracket in the film, uh, films.js. Uh, and then the main code of that function, it just returns, you always put a bracket around everything because otherwise in JavaScript, um, that, that line that just says return on its own line, it would think that's the end of the return statement and return absolutely nothing. Um, so the, um, the round bracket on the line that which has the word return on it just means uh, JavaScript keeps looking for more stuff to return. That's just a, a feature of JavaScript. Uh, but then the actual stuff that it returns in this case is a span uh, with a class which is uh, used in the CSS and then the text that says search and then an input box, which is where we saw, um, uh, which is why we saw the word search and an input box in our UI. Now, one thing to notice about that, I said that this is HTML-like code. Um, so that bit within the brackets, it looks a lot like HTML. But one difference you should pay attention to is that it doesn't say class equals search. It says class name equals search. So it's, uh, in some places, it's using actually the, um, the JavaScript -y language uh, to refer to certain things. Um, so it's not quite the same as HTML. And we'll see um, it's, it's unlike HTML because it can have JavaScript um, stuck into it as well. So we'll see that in a bit.
Uh, so just a quick look at what search.css looks like. So you don't need to look at the details of this, but what, uh, just notice that, that that CSS file it is um, uh, doing stuff to those HTML components that we defined in the previous um, slide because it had class name equals search, which in HTML would get translated into class equals search. And then we've done some um, uh, CSS that applies to that class. So you don't need to look at the detail of that. So let's flip back to films.js. Um, we talked, we just talked about search. So now let's talk about list, which is a slightly more complicated component. Have a look at that. Um, so I've split this over two slides. Um, so again, uh, a component is just a function. Uh, this function is called list. Uh, and then uh, I have pretended that we've gone and got some films from some kind of search. Um, uh, request to some kind of search engine or something, but actually I've just put them into um, a, a constant array there at the top. So that's what that, that variable films is. And then there's a bit of HTML with some headings and a body. And I've missed out the body because there's too much of it. So the body is going to come on the next slide. So here's how we fill in the body. So T body, that's just how you make um, a body in a, a table. Um, but then after that T body tag, we've got this open curly bracket. So that means do some JavaScript inside here. So you can basically put any JavaScript, you, any JavaScript expression you like um, inside those curly brackets. Uh, and then you'll notice that inside, so that, then films.map is basically saying um, for everything in that array called films, uh, do something. And the, the something that it does is this uh, arrow function inside the bracket. So F arrow and then blah means basically define a little function in there. And that's what gets called every time for every film. So F becomes that film that we're looking at. And you'll notice that actually there's more HTML-like stuff inside the JavaScript. So we've got HTML-like stuff and then a curly bracket to say do some JavaScript. Then inside that JavaScript there's a function and the return value of that function is actually some more HTML-like stuff. And actually inside that HTML-like stuff there's more JavaScript for that F.name, F.genre, things like that. So you can mix up uh, these tags and these bits of JavaScript, as long as you remember that um, you use the curly brackets to sort of come out of the mode of HTML-like stuff and back into JavaScript. So it's worth bearing in mind here that what I'm not describing here is a template language. So it's not like some special language with little commands that you can insert into your HTML that do things like for loops and stuff like that. What it is instead is that whenever you start a tag like tbody or tr here, um, you're actually returning um, a JavaScript expression. It's just it's, it gives you a bit of syntactic sugar, so that it looks like you're returning an HTML tag. But actually, this stuff's going to get transformed into essentially it's just going to be like a function call saying create a React element of a tag name T body or a tag name TR. Um, so if you ever get confused about what's going on here, that's what's really happening. Anytime there's some, some stuff that, with the diagonal brackets. Uh, are all the way until the end of that tag is basically going to get translated into a little function called saying create create an element and return it. Um, yeah, so it's not a templating language, which means that you're much more likely to see stuff like films.map here rather than some kind of for loop or something like that because a for loop won't really work for that because you have to return an expression, not um, not like go through and print each line or something like that. So it always has to be an expression. And by an expression, I just mean um, like a value that's getting returned. So, um, as I, as I've been showing you, you write your most of your React code in this mixture of JavaScript and HTML, and also some CSS. Um, but that mixture of JavaScript and HTML is called JSX. Um, what does that stand for? I think it stands for JavaScript and XML or something. But anyway, it looks a bit like um, XHTML, not quite exactly like it, but something like that. And as I said, it's not a templating language. Um, it's just syntactic sugar for creating an object and returning it. Uh, it's pretty convenient to use, actually. Once you get used to it, uh, you hardly notice it. Um, it's a pretty nice language to work with so far from what I've seen. Um, and uh, yeah, before I get onto that. So uh, the other thing I want to say is this um, style of creating uh, components is one of the two possible styles uh, that React provides you. There's, a, there's this so-called functional style or function style, which is what I've shown you, uh, where each of each component is a function. 
And it's a function that basically describes the HTML that you want and returns it. And there is another style called the class style. Um, and I'm avoiding talking about the class style because I think it makes it harder to understand what's going on. Um, in, in some fundamental way, I suggest you should think of your React components as a function that describes some HTML and or returns the description of some HTML. And you shouldn't think of it as an instance of a class because that's not a very good... Um, that doesn't fit very well with what it really what is really happening and we'll get into that a bit more later on so I would highly recommend using the function style or the functional style um, it used to be that the functional style or the function style uh, w wasn't flexible enough to do everything you might want to do in React uh, but now it is so if you read documentation saying you can't do that you have to switch to the class style that's out of date you now can do everything you want in the function style and I'll show you how that works for at least some of that functionality um, yeah, so if you see React code that looks different from this, it's probably using a class style. I don't like the class style because it doesn't help you think about things, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. So apologies if that's um, what you were hoping to get. Hopefully, uh, what you get from this video is a, a strong enough grasp of the ideas, including my reasoning why I like the function style, um, and then the class style will make more sense to you and why it's a bit weird might even become clear. Uh, maybe. Okay, so we're back into films.js, which is our top level component, um, which was uh, included from index.js. And I've made a change to it now. So what I'm showing you here is that, um, uh, uh, like I said, each of these components, like title, search, and list, and indeed films, is, is, uh, like a function. I mean, it is a function that you're using to describe it. It also kind of acts like a function in the React world. So um, one thing about functions that is useful is that you can pass arguments to them. So what I'm showing you here is I'm passing an argument called highlight into the list component. Or um, what I'm actually doing is making like an HTML attribute called highlight um, with that value odd fav. Um, and what that kind of works pretty much like passing an argument into the function. Not exactly like passing an argument into the function. What it's actually like is that um, all of these functions get this argument passed into them, which is always called props in all everyone's code. So I would definitely recommend you should call yours props, although you probably don't have to. Um, and and if you've added that attribute like I did called highlight, then props um, will contain a, um, a, a property called highlight. Um, so you can see here in the green, um, because I I changed my um, my list function so that it took in this props argument instead of taking no arguments, in which case actually you're just ignoring the props argument. But yeah, so now I've changed my list function, so it takes in this argument called props, and then you can see from the green here, props has this uh, property called highlight, uh, and that came through from the attribute that I showed you in the previous slide. Uh, and what I'm doing with that uh, value is I'm passing it to a function that's also called highlight, so maybe that's confusing, apologies if so. But yeah, in red um, is where we're passing um, uh, that that value, which was odd fav, uh, through to this function called highlight, and uh, previously this code just looked like f dot name, but now it's like highlight f dot name with this uh, this particular string to highlight. So if I maybe it'll be clearer if I show you. So the effect that that has now that I've changed that code so that um, this attribute highlight is getting passed through, is that that highlight function modifies the name of the film, which just used to just say the Godfather. To be the Godfather, but with um, some of the letters a different colour, which I, I used a span to do that. But that, that you shouldn't be particularly bothered about how I did it. Just what's what's interesting uh, in this example is that I managed to pass in like an argument into that list component. So uh, again, uh, components are a bit like functions, uh, and the useful thing about functions is that you can pass arguments to them to make them behave differently. Um, so that's what we've done. We passed in like this attribute argument thing, telling it to highlight those letters, and you can see that it does highlight those letters. So what it actually did was it tried to highlight those letters in all all the film's names, because that code's getting called for every film, but only one of them actually had those letters in, so only one of them got highlighted. With me so far. Uh, yeah, so is this what I was just saying already? Components are a bit like functions. You can pass in arguments using a props thing. Um, and something that's probably obvious from the way we're doing it here, props are input to your 
function. So that you shouldn't change that value. In fact, it kind of, the way I've shown it to you, it wouldn't make sense to change props. So props is an argument that gets passed into your function. Um, as I was saying, that's one of the reasons why I prefer this function style um, of defining a component in the class style. It's harder to understand why you shouldn't change props. In this style, hopefully it's kind of obvious. Why would you change it? So you can think of props as being uh, things that move inward through your component. So in our um, program that I've been showing you, we've only really got two layers. We've got this big component called films, and inside it, they have these small components like um, list, and the properties flow inwards from from the outside, uh, uh, which is films, towards, uh, in this case, list, which is on the inside. So props flow inwards through your code. Okay, so that was props and uh, basically what components are. It was kind of like you describe some HTML in a function. Uh, now I want to talk about state. And before I talk about state, I want to talk to you about what state is. So state is basically something that can change, that, that stays around and can get changed. So if we go back to um, the old world of Web 1.0, before Google Maps or any other clever single-page web apps like Gmail or apps that weren't written by Google. And uh, we used to have a situation where in Web 1.0 where you would ask for a page. So that's the top request. Um, your HTTP request would go to the server. The server would probably talk to a database, uh, find out some information, send you back a response, which was a page uh, showing you some stuff. Uh, and then if you wanted to see something else, you'd click on a link or something like that, or submit a form. That would send a request off to the server. The server would talk to the database um, and send you back another page. So that's how Web 1.0 used to work. Um, and as you can see here, the orange stuff I'm illustrating here as state. So in this situation in Web 1.0, the state was just stored in the database um, miles away from you, or was it? Well, that's the way we used to often think of it, but really that's not really true. So in Web 1.0, you still had some things going on in the browser, some stuff getting stored briefly in the browser. So for example, if you type some text into a text box, it wouldn't just disappear again, it would stay there. So, um, or if you chose a, a, a choice from a drop down list or something like that, um, once you made that choice, it would stay there until you moved on to the next page. So actually, there is a little bit of what we're calling state, i.e. just stuff that gets held onto and can be changed. Uh, in in the web browser, on your computer, not just stored in the database. But that state didn't hang around for very long um, because when you went to a new page, that new page would have a whole completely new state. So that was Web 1.0 before flashy new things ruined the world. So now uh, when everything went wrong, we moved into Web 2.0. In Web 2.0, you would send a request to the server um, and it would give you back a response, which is a page. But then everything else you did in that page, um, the page itself will make some little requests to the server and send back, and the response will come back as JSON or something like that. And then they'll send another request and the response will come back. And every time a response comes back, instead of uh, that response being a new page to load, that response will be some information which the already existing and continuing to exist page uses to update itself and look different. So, um, uh, like in the application that I was showing you, um, when I pressed a key in that input box, it didn't go off and load a new page uh, with one more key pressed and then display that. Instead, it it, uh, it pretended to send a request. It doesn't actually send a request. Um, uh, and then it modified how that page looked um, based on what you've done. So, uh, as you can see illustrated here, uh, for that situation to work, that a whole load of more of what we're calling state needs to exist in the web browser, inside that page. Um, so potentially you could be building up quite a complex document where you've done all kinds of stuff, like maybe drawn a diagram or some clever uh, stuff that you've done in your React app. Uh, and that, that would all be stored in the page in your web browser and not be uh, just a reflection of something that's saved in the database. So that stuff on the left that's stored in the page is nothing like what's stored in the database. So something that I find really confusing, or I found really confusing about uh, getting the hang of um, uh, these web modern web frameworks 
is that when they talk about state, they're not, they're not talking about what's in the database at all. They're talking about, uh, the information that's being held to show you a consistent thing. When you make changes in the browser, those changes don't just flip back to how they were before, but actually stay there and you can keep on modifying. So that is a whole massive roundabout way of saying when we're talking about state in React, we are not talking about the stuff on the right hand side of that page. We're only talking about, um, the information that's held in the browser uh, to remember what you did or display the current state of uh, your your interaction with that page. That's what we're talking about when we say state. Okay, so how does state work in React? Well, React tries to um, model state as um, a stuff that, ch that sits within the component that you're working with. So, for example, the state of that input box that's got the word foo in it um, is that the, the current value is foo. Uh, and if the um, the list component had some kind of modifiability to it, for example, you could select a row or something like that, or choose how to sort the columns, uh, that state of which column am I sorting by or which row is selected uh, would be uh, is intended to be stored within that list component. So. Um, the idea is that the components, in terms of the, this type of, this concept of state, i.e. like stuff that helps you just display yourself correctly, um, that can live inside the component, not in some other part of the program. Um, so how does this all really work? Well, um, we've got to get in a little bit into how the whole of React works. So I'm going to try and give you a summary of that, and I'll, I'll unpack it over the next few slides, so hopefully if this is confusing, it will gradually get less confusing. So let's start at the top. So um, React uh, renders a page, so that basically means calling your function and finding out um, what HTML you described in your function. Then React does some magic to take that description that you've given and turn it into an actual... Uh, HTML DOM, so the actual stuff in the browser uh, that gets displayed. Um, and that gets shown to the user by the browser, and then we wait. So now we're in that user box. And then at some point, the user does something, like clicks on a button or drags something or scrolls or whatever. Also, by the way, some other stuff could happen, like a web request could get re receive its response, or a timer could tick, or something like that. So I'm only talking about the user clicking stuff. So when the user... Uh, does something. What that does, um, you can describe in the HTML that you've made that when something happens, you want uh, a function to get called. So, and it's so called a so called event happens, but essentially that's a function getting called. So that's a piece of code. So that's the bottom circle. Um, and then potentially, uh, if you wanted to, what that code will do is set the state of this component. So modify. Um, the, that stored bit of information about what is the state of this component. For example, the input box now contains the word food when before it contained the word foo or something like that. It, so we, we'll call this kind of set state function. What that set state function does is two things. Firstly, it updates the state held in that component. So it like just keeps the record of the fact that the word has changed from foo to food. But it also does something very important, which is it triggers React to say, you've got to re-render all of these components, and uh, that's a bit of magic happening. And then the cycle starts again. So it renders it, gets displayed, and then we wait for some other event to happen. So that's the way state fits into React. And I've shown you this diagram because I want to try and explain enough for you to understand it that you won't make some of the common mistakes that can be made with state. So we'll get onto that. So this is how um, you make a functional React component which has some state in it. So this is the search component again, but I've added some stuff to it. So in the imports at the top, I've imported this magic function called useState. And then um, I'm, I'm then in highlighted in green a little bit lower down, you can see that I'm calling the useState function and it returns an array with two things in it. So that's a bit confusing, but let's first talk about useState. So when you call useState, you say, you say to it, I want you to hold on to, to some state for me. And here is its initial value. So in this case, we're a search box. So our initial value is going to be an empty string because we're going to have nothing typed into that search box until you actually type something. So we're just passing in the empty string to say, um, uh, start off with this value. And then uh, later on, um, it's going to change because I'm going to set it. 
Uh, and what use state does, as I said, is it returns an array containing two things. So if you've not seen that construct before, this const open square bracket search comma set search blah blah blah, what that what that means is is that it's expecting use state to return an array with two things in it, and instead of holding that answer in an array, it's putting the two parts of the array into two variables search and set search. So it's essentially just saying there are two variables search and set search, which should be set to the things that get returned by use state. So what use state gives you back is two things. Number one, the um, the current state. So the, uh, the first time we call this function, it's going to be the empty string, like I said, because that's the, the beginning state of this object. But it also returns um, uh, a function that you can use to change that state. And we'll see how that gets used in a little bit. So it's it's returning you the current state and the function that you can use to change that state. So next time we get into this function, if the state has been changed, search what won't be set to the empty string anymore. It will get set to foo. Now, how that works underneath is basically magic as far as you're concerned. So feel free to dig into that, figure out how it works. But if it's confusing and weird to you, that's normal and right. It is, it's a weird magical thing. Um, and it's kind of the price we pay for using this functional style to do something that is kind of not, um, not a stateless thing. Um, so, um, if you really hate that, have a look at the class style, but I think the downsides of the class style are worse. But yeah, for now, just trust me that the first time you call use state, it's going to give you back the, the empty string in your search variable. Um, but then next time this function gets called, if that state's been modified in some way, then use state is actually going to return a different thing. It's going to return a foo or food or whatever we've, we've typed into that search box. Um, but yeah, you get back search and you also get back, so the, the value of the state is search. You also get back set search, which is a function you can call to update search. So what you shouldn't do is modify search itself by saying search equals hello or something like that. You should never do that. What you should do is call the function called set search. Now, for, for just a few more minutes, trust me that you shouldn't change search. Uh, in a minute, I'll try and explain why you shouldn't change search. And in a way, I've already explained. So um, keep your ears open. Okay, so how are we using these uh, things that we got back from that use state call? Well, have a look all the way further down. So remember, we before we had this span with a class name of search and stuff like that, we had an input and we had a value and the value was just hard-coded at the time. Uh, uh, and it was hard-coded to uh, foo, I think. Um, so now instead of value being hard-coded, we've got value equals and then curly bracket search, close curly bracket. So what that uh, means, we already, we've already seen before that when you want to substitute JavaScript in, um, in the middle of your HTML, you just do curly brackets and like that. But notice there are no double quotes here. Um, you must miss out the double quotes. So when you're, when you're saying, giving an attribute value like this, you just put value equals curly bracket blah. You don't put quotes. So what that's saying, as I said, search is the current state. So the current uh, thing that's held in that input box uh, or shown in that input box. Um, so it makes sense that we would pass that in as the value of the input, right? Because we're, every time we're describing the HTML we want to see, the HTML we want to see is an input box with a value set to whatever you've just typed. So search is what you've typed. But what we've also added to, um, input is this on change thing. So that's, again, it's like the HTML, uh, it's exactly what you type in HTML, except this, the C is capital and you need, that needs to be capital in the React world. Again, it's like the JavaScripty way of doing things. So it's this mixture of HTML and JavaScript. Um, anyway, so input boxes in HTML can have an on change attribute and they tell they, in HTML, that would give you some JavaScript to run. Um, when, when anything gets typed into that input box. So what we're doing here is similar to the line above. We're giving it a value, but the value we're giving it here is uh, a function that got defined nearer to the top of the file. That function is called search changed, and that gets defined on the line that says const search changed equals blah, 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 blah. So search changed is a little function to run when uh, the input gets changed. So this is an event, like I was describing before. So an event, as I said, is just a function. It's a function that takes in um, this argument called E, uh, which is, uh, E stands for event. And 
search, so ch search changed is an arrow function. So that's why it's bracket E bracket and then that arrow e that equals greater than sign. So that's just the modern JavaScript way of defining a uh, little function in line. Uh, I would recommend using that way of defining functions instead of just saying the word function and stuff like that, because, um, though that type of function it can have some confusion about what the word this is referring to. If we use an arrow function like this, we don't have to worry about that at all. So uh, that's just my little hint. So we use, uh, so basically search change is a little function. You can see the body of a function, uh, called set search, and then it, it writes something into the log, um, basically, um, pretending that it's searching, uh, that it's sending some kind of HTTP request to do a real search, but actually it's just logging something. So the key thing here is, um, uh, it's calling set search and set search is one of those two things that got returned by use state. And as I said before, that is the function that you use if you want to change the state of this component. So the state of this component is, is going to always reflect what you typed. So if you type something, that's going to cause an on change event. The on change we've set to call this function called search changed and inside search changed, we get the, um, the current value of the input box. That's what e dot target dot value is. And we pass it into set search and set search is this magic function that we're, we're allowed to use to change search. So what we definitely shouldn't do is say search equals e dot target dot value. That would be really bad. Instead, we should call set search. Um, uh, yeah, so that, uh, that was basically, um, how you store state. But then what I wanted to do is also demonstrate to you, um, why it might be useful to have that state stored. Um, so, uh, here's just a little example of that. So this is another change to the same piece of code. Um, so it, for the input now, we've changed it a little bit more. We've, we've added another line, which is class name equals curly bracket count class. Uh, so basically we're saying, um, the the CSS class, so basically how to display that input box, um, is getting modified, is getting set to whatever the return value of calling calc class is. So this is, you can see how you can make uh, an input box um, uh, change its behavior based on what's in it. So if we, if I just remind you of the example that we had, if I start typing stuff into this input box, um, things happen, as in the letters appear, as you'd expect. Um, but then what I've done is if the, uh, if the, the type stuff that you've typed in is too long, because it's longer than three characters, then your text goes red. So how does that work? Well, how it works is the class gets changed from nothing to bad. And we can see where that happens in the calc class function. So the calc class function doesn't take any arguments, but what it does do is it uses the value of search, which is that thing we got back from the use state, um, function call that we made. Um, so uh, search is essentially what's stored in the input box. And we check the length of it. And if the length is greater than three, we set the class of this input or class name of this input to bad. And what that means is that it, it there's a little bit of CSS saying if stuff has a class name of bad, then make it red. So that's just us holding some state inside the component, the search component and then using that state to change what that component looks like. So that's what state is for, is for changing uh, what your component looks like. And that might be some massive change, like, you know, there's an enormous list of films, so your component suddenly has 100 rows in it. <clears throat> or it could be something very small like this, like if the number of letters that you've typed is more than three, make it go red. But that is state. And where it makes sense in React, you should store uh, the state of a component inside that component. But we'll see that sometimes that doesn't make sense. Uh, so here's my uh, demonstration of that. When you type in too many letters, it goes red. Okay. Um, by the way, I never showed you the CSS that makes it go red, but you can figure that out for yourself. Or actually, you can look at these slides um, on GitLab. Um, there's a link somewhere near the beginning. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, so a few more things to say about state. Um, never modify that state variable. So in this case, that variable was called search. Instead, you should always use that set state function like in our case it was called set search but you get to name that i would just highly recommend that you call it blah and set blah so why why shouldn't you modify the state variable yourself well let's go back to this diagram um, and i'm now now i'm showing you a broken version of this diagram and the reason it's broken is because you modified the state variable instead of calling that set 
state function or set search. You modified search instead of calling set search. So um, let's talk a little bit more about the magic. So the right, the left hand yellow arrow, where, which I've labeled React Magic, what that actually does, as I said, when you call set state, not only does it update um, the value of the state, it also triggers um, React to re-render. So if you don't call set state, if you just modify the state, it won't trigger React to re-render. So um, things won't update in the way that they should in your UI. Uh, but if only that were the only problem, the problem is actually much worse than that. What React really does um, is it looks at what you said the HTML should look like. Because remember I said it's describing the HTML. It looks at what you said the HTML should look like, but it doesn't just go ahead and make that so in the browser. What it actually does is compares what you said last time with what you're saying this time. So if you only change one thing out of a million things on your page, React will, uh, even though you returned a whole great, the whole picture of all the HTML that you wanted, what React will do is compare what you just said with what you said last time, and then it will um, reduce that down to the smallest possible change it can make to the page um, that will mean that your page looks the way you said it should look, and then it will make that small change. The reason it does that, by the way, is because making changes in what the uh, browser is actually rendering in the DOM uh, is really slow, much slower than just running some JavaScript code. So even though you thought when you were writing your component you were describing real um, HTML, you weren't actually. What you're actually doing when you see those diagonal brackets is re you're returning, like I said in the beginning, you're, uh, you're returning a, an object that's like a React element type. So what you're not returning a real life browser DOM element because those are huge and slow. What you're returning is one of these very lightweight descriptions of what the DOM should look like um, in React special language for describing what the DOM should look like. And then uh, React does this um, diffing, it calls it, um, understanding the difference between the DOM you asked for last time and the DOM you asked for this time, or rather the HTML you asked for last time, the elements you asked for last time and the elements you asked for this time. And then it makes changes in the real browser DOM uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, like as small change as possible so that um, the browser still works fast. Otherwise, if you made, if it deleted the whole DOM and redrew the whole DOM every time, um, your application would be very slow. Anyway, that is all just preamble for an explanation of why this goes wrong. Because not only have you not triggered React by not calling set the set search function, or this set state, whatever it's called, um, it's much worse than that. What you've actually done is modified the thing it was going to use to compare against the um, the new version that you've made. Um, so don't modify that state variable, which in our case was called search, because React is actually going to use that to check whether you've changed anything when you call the set search function, or whatever your setter is called. So um, that's what that little line that says uses exclamation mark means. It means the magic is actually making use of that variable, but now you've changed that variable. It's a nightmare. Don't do it. So um, uh, that's what you shouldn't do. And hopefully that makes, um, having that background helps you understand why not to do it, which at least for me, once I understand why not to do something, I'm much more likely to remember not to do it. So let's talk a little bit more about events. So as I said before, events are just functions. And we saw how in that search box, we set um, the on change attribute to, to say, uh, call this search change function. Uh, and so events, uh, uh, events are either the function or the thing that gets passed to the function because that argument to that search change function is called E and that's an event. So maybe that's what an event is anyway. When events happen, functions get called and you get past this thing which I've called E here, which is um, a kind of standard uh, JavaScript event object. So it, that's why it has this target property and target has a value in this case because it's an input box. There'll always be a target. It depends on the uh, um, what type of event it is, whether it has that value property or something else. Um, so that was basically how, what happens when events happen. Um, but if I switch back to our app, you can see that when I type stuff into this box, um, not, not only the search box changes, also the list changes. So remember that our state, as we described it so far, was inside that search component. So how does the list component change? 
So your immediate reaction, if you're anything like me, would be, well, how can I get the list component to ask the search component what its state is and then use that? And according to the React way of doing things, that is totally the wrong way of thinking about it. So basically, you can't make list use the state that's inside search uh, because that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Instead, what you should do is kind of merge together list and search into um, not into one component, but into a thing that in some way share that state. And the way that you do that is not put like a copy of that state in both components, but actually put the state in the component that contains both of those components and then use attributes or props to pass the relevant information down into the components. So that is called lifting. So essentially we're, we're moving that state from just being inside the search box to now being in the component that contains the search box, which is the films component. That way films can pass the relevant stuff down into list and into search and they can both make use of it. Um, so here's a bit more description of that. So instead of um, the event uh, handling function, which was called search changed, being defined inside search, let's define it outside of search, that's actually going to be in films, and let's pass it in in the props of search. So here, this is us doing that, so search now takes this argument props and um, uh, the on change uh, attribute of that input box um, is going to say the function you should call is called search changed out of my props. So that's that's a way of kind of lifting the event handling out of the search component. But then the other part we need to do, like I said, is move the state out of the search component. Otherwise, no one else will be able to see it. So sometimes, by the way, just having the event via um, might be enough. If you, it depends what you want to do, but often you want the state the actual thing you typed into the search box to be visible to um, multiple components. So that's what you do in that case, case is you stop calling use state inside, inside search because that's the thing that means the state is actually stored in search. And instead, we're going to call use state outside of here and we're going to pass in the answer. This um, props.search is us passing search in um, as one of the props. So let's have a look at the films component, see what that looks like. So as I said, you pass search in as one of the props of the search uh, component. So I'm looking near, nearish the bottom of the page here. If we look at the, where we're actually using um, diagonal bracket search, uh, it's got two attributes. So we're passing in two attributes that are going to be useful to that search component, uh, search and search change. And that's why props contains search and search change. If I go back to the previous slide, you can see we're assuming that props here will contain, we can say props.search, props.search changed. The reason we can assume that is because those two attributes are being set uh, in that search widget. Uh, and we're just setting search to search and search change to search changed. And we're defining search and search changed near the top of this file. So as you can see, the use state call, which, uh, which basically says, I want you to hold on to some state for me. Uh, that used to happen inside the search component, but now we're in films. And now it's happening in the films component. So um, it's a good thing we called these variables search and set search. It would have been really unclear if we'd called them state and set state or something like that, or value and set value. Fortunately, we were really clever and we called them search and set search, which are still suitable names to be used here. So yeah, we call use state inside films instead of inside search. And we define this search changed function, which looks almost exactly like it did before. In fact, it looks exactly like it did before inside search, but now it's defined inside films. Um, and uh, notice what we're also doing at the very towards the very bottom, where we're making our list component. We're or we're passing in an ar the search argument into our list component. So you remember our list component uh, already has an attribute called highlight, and we were passing in odd files, weren't we? Like a, a hard-coded string, so that odd files was always what got highlighted in the list component. Uh, but now we can do better than that. We can we can pass into it what the person actually searched for, what I used the search for. So search is getting passed into into the search component, and it's getting passed into the list component. Uh, in, in the search component, it gets used basically to show it in the input box, and to adjust the color of the input box based on its length. But in the list component, the same value search is getting passed in as this is the thing you should highlight. So that's how you share state between multiple multiple components. You don't get one component to look at the other one. 
what you do is uh, lift, so-called lift, the state into the component that contains both of those components and then pass the state in. And you'll notice that um, set search isn't being passed in to anyone. Um, so in a way that's quite nice. Those components don't do anything clever. They just, um, when there's an event in search, it gets called, uh, it, it calls the thing you told it to call. So search has become quite independent. Um, it just knows how to display um, the state that's being defined somewhere else. Maybe that's a bit nice. Uh, and list doesn't do anything, doesn't have any events or anything like that. All it, all it does is uses that as input, what the user search for, um, to help it display itself. So here's a way of um, thinking about these events. Events flow outwards through your program. So we had props flowing inwards, state kind of sitting in one place, and events flow outwards. So what I mean by events flow outwards is basically you pass through the props, event handling functions, so that, that the passing the function in to call goes inwards in the props. And then when you call them, that kind of goes back outwards in some sense. Like you're calling a function that was passed into you. That's all I really mean. But that can get passed down multiple levels. Um, so it feels a little bit like you're calling a function from far out um, because that function got passed into you um, through, through props in each component. Uh, and that's how we get this functionality, so that when you type in AT in that box at the top, um, the, the state about what you've typed is now held in the films component. So the films component has passed it down to the list component, and the list uses it to highlight that text. I hope you're with me so far. Leave a comment if not. Um, this might immediately make you think, hold on. You told me state was held in each component that needed it. It was held like in the individual components. But with this whole lifting thing, if I want anything to respond to anything else that's happening, I'm going to have to lift up my state uh, into the component at the top, surely. And uh, my answer is, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, it does seem to work out like that. Actually, I'm a big fan of Elm, which is a um, really amazing programming language for um, making websites um, similar to React, but it's a separate programming language, which means it can enforce its rules very harshly instead of React just kind of shouting at you not to do things. Uh, so Elm was a, like an inspiration for, for React. The people who wrote React were like, hey, Elm's really cool, but can we have that in JavaScript? Um, and they wrote React. And uh, in Elm as well, you do end up with this problem where all the state ends up just in the middle uh, and that's sad, and that is just the case. And that's why you end up with um, oops, uh, uh, some libraries that, that try and help you with that situation. They don't really fix the problem, but they help it. So there's a, a library called Redux, which I'm hoping to do a video about fairly soon. And what that basically says is, yes, okay, all of your state is this horrific ball of mud, um, this great big thing that is just one state thing, um, but I will help you use it so that it doesn't feel quite so bad. That's what Redux is for. Um, because, yes, you will end up with a lot of your state just in your top-level component. But maybe that's good, because then your, your further down components are purely functional. don't have to do any of the kind of hard work of managing stateful stuff, which is more messy. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what's really going on, um, the way I understand it. I'm, I'm probably wrong about the details, but... Um, uh, I'm hoping that, at least conceptually, the way I explain things will help you um, have your head around it enough that you um, you don't make the most frequent mistakes or you just understand the documentation. So here's uh, here's the same cycle that I was talking about before, but written in words. So uh, it doesn't matter where we start in the cycle. Let's, so let's start with the rendering process gets triggered. Um, your JSX, which was um, turned into JavaScript by the compile process that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so your, your code runs and it builds some uh, objects which describe the HTML that you want. So those objects are like a lightweight representation of the real life HTML that you want, the DOM. Um, but they're written with these small, um, easy to construct objects. Uh, called things like React Element. So what React does is takes the last thing you told it and the thing you just told it right now and compares them against each other. 
um, then it modifies the real DOM in the browser in a minimal way to reflect your changes. Uh, and then the browser shows that to user and we wait for something to happen. Then the user does something or something, someone else does something. That calls a function, which we're calling an event. And inside that function, probably, it's going to change some state. It's going to call set something, set search or set blah. Um, and what that does is triggers uh, rendering the whole thing again. Um, and that means calling your function again. So, um, what's really going on? You don't change the DOM, you change the model. And changing the model triggers a re-render. So when you're writing horrific uh, code where events are flying around everywhere, and you never know what's going to happen before what, uh, and your input box was supposed to be disabled except when the number three was typed in the other input box, but weirdly my input box is not disabled even though I typed three, and it's actually because a whole load of events happened in an order you didn't expect, or some horrific pain like that. Uh, you can't, that stuff can't happen in React because you don't, you don't set your input box as disabled because something happened. What you do when something happens is you change the model. So you change your kind of, um, clean and systematic representation of the current state of the world, which is your model by calling set blah, set search or whatever. And then React takes that change and says, okay, they've changed the model. I'm going to ask them to re-render their HTML. So React asks you to, uh, calls your functions, your, which are your components. Uh, your components return this re representation of HTML and um, React uses that to make the DOM look right. So you don't get into that weird situation where um, the how the UI looks doesn't represent the, the true state of the UI because it's impossible. Because you don't change how the UI looks, you only change the state of the model and then you use the state of the model to display the right HTML. Um, so that's why it's better. So uh, given that understanding of how things work uh, underneath, you'll hopefully have a little bit more understanding of why you've got a few rules you have to follow. So number one, don't change props. Um, and in the model, the functional model, you won't really be tempted to change props. Uh, also, don't change state um, because you need to trigger that re-rendering process. Um, don't try and figure out how to make one component understand the state of another component, keep things in sync. I'm sure because it's JavaScript, there's some evil way you could do that. Don't try it. Instead, lift your state up into the component that contains both of your components, even if that means lifting all of your state up to the top level. Um, other things that um, hopefully some of my explanation will help you remember. Um, if you've got a whole list of items like we have in our films list, uh, each of those items should have an attribute. Actually, in the in the HTML, where you've got like an li tag or something like that for your list item, or in our case, it's a table, isn't it? So that would be where you've got a tr tag for the, that row of the table. You should add an extra attribute called key and give the, that um, uh, the value of that attribute and a unique value within that list. The reason you should do that is because when React is doing that diff to say what's changed. If you've deleted an item from the middle of that list, um, the by default React is just going to say, oh, um, item number three's changed, item number four's changed, and item number five's changed, blah, 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 and change everything after the one that got deleted. Um, because it's not clever enough to say, oh, actually, um, or none of the items are changed except one that got deleted. But if you provide a key that's unique within that list, uh, React can say, oh, well, I can see that the one with this key got deleted and all the others are just the same. So it makes it easier for React to do that diffing. Um, also, um, don't directly use the state or the props values to do as arguments in that, or as part of the arguments in that set state function. So don't call set search, but inside the value that you're passing to set search, actually use search. So the reason why you shouldn't do that is because that update might not happen quite as quickly as you think. So actually, when I said that set search triggers re-rendering, uh, it doesn't necessarily immediately trigger re-rendering. Um, it'll trigger re-rendering when it's good and ready. Maybe it batches up a few changes before it does it. Um, so the value that you passed in, which in our case was called search, won't necessarily be still be right at the time when 
that thing is actually running. So don't do that. Instead, what you should do is either just don't use them at all, or use the other form of the set search or set state set state function, which can actually take a function to call to set the state instead of um, instead of just passing in the value. So have a look in the documentation if that's not clear. But basically, don't don't directly use search inside a call to set search or equivalent or props either. Okay, other things about what's going on underneath that might help you understand what's going on. So if you ran create react app, it's actually set up a whole load of build process for you um, using a whole load of cool tools um, to build your app. So that by by running create react app, you set up all this stuff, and what that stuff does is it allows you to follow this build process. So basically, you write some JSX code, um, then you run npm. So in our case, we run npm start. What actually happens is a whole build process, and then it launches a like a web server. So the the build process launches this tool called Babel, which is itself written in um, JavaScript, and um, Babel does a whole load of things with your code. So the key thing that it does, the most, the most obvious thing to us at least, is it takes your JSX code, so all those HTML-like tags that are in the middle of your JavaScript, and converts that into plain old JavaScript, which a browser understands. So as I said, every time you put a diagonal bracket, it converts that into essentially create an element with this tag and with these, this stuff inside it, and so on and so on. So that's what Babel does. But Babel also does a whole load of other cool stuff. Um, like it can compile uh, cool modern JavaScript into old-fashioned boring JavaScript uh, so that all your old um, uh, hor horrific old browsers will still understand it. Um, also, the build process does a whole load of other things. So I'm not sure whether this is Babel or other stuff. It's probably other stuff. Uh, including it runs ESLint over your JavaScript. So basically check that checks that your JavaScript's not uh, bad. Or it can do that. I'm not certain whether it does that by default. Uh, but also it can um, understand TypeScript as well as JavaScript. So if you write your code in TypeScript instead of uh, JavaScript, it will convert it into JavaScript by basically stripping out your type annotations. It also does, does CSS processing. So like I said, if we write some CSS in that search.css file, it won't interfere with um, some other stuff uh, that's happening in, say, list or some other component. Uh, it also does some other CSS processing, I think. Uh, then what it does, it probably does a few other things I'm not aware of, but it, uh, it launches Webpack. So what Webpack does is kind of compiles your JavaScript into like smaller JavaScript and combines everything into um, just a couple of files. Uh, that the, the main reason for that is the browsers are much better at downloading one slightly bigger file than say five very small files because they have to it has to make multiple requests to do that. So it's a bit slow. Uh, so Webpack uh, takes a load of JavaScript and also CSS and other stuff, I think, packs it all up into um, only a couple of files for the browser to download. Uh, and then also, just for good measure, the build process produces an HTML file based on uh, an HTML file that, that you wrote, which is probably really simple and small, called index.html. It adds a little bit more to that to load in your JavaScript and your CSS. So that's uh, how the build process works. And that is essentially what's going on underneath your React app. Hopefully, there's enough of the ideas there of what of how um, React is actually um, working on your code underneath that you understand some of the slightly confusing rules about it. As I said before, I definitely recommend using the function style of uh, writing components um, rather than the class style because I think it makes this stuff a lot clearer and easier to understand. Um, the other part that I haven't covered in this video is how to trigger uh, events to happen, for example, when my component got loaded or like set a timer to run and things like that. So you should look in the documentation for effects. And the way to use effects in um, in a function component is there's a function called use effect. Uh, so have a look at that in the documentation. As I said, I will probably do another video about Redux, um, which is uh, one of the several tools that are available for managing the fact that your state has become a huge ball of mud because you want everything to know about everything. Uh, and that's it for this video. So uh, you can find my videos on Peertube. Uh, the URL is there on peertube.mastodon.host, or you can find them on YouTube. Um, you can find me on Twitter, although I would much prefer you found me on mastodon.social, Andy Balaam, at mastodon.social. Uh, you can find out more about me and my stuff at artificialworlds.net, including my blog. Uh, you can find the 
the slides for this presentation and the code that goes with it uh, and loads of other stuff on GitLab and also some stuff on GitHub. Thanks for watching. Uh, see you next time.